Grow the f up. You're not children anymore. I didn't mind explaining photosynthesis to you when you were 12, but you're adults now, and this is an actual crisis. Got it? Safety glasses off, motherfuckers. We are beyond mitigation. We saw some animals looking for ice so that they can rest. Humans really require a big kick in the butt before we ever change. It's kind of shocking. Awareness of the need to make changes is, is growing. Climate change is that kick in the butt. Faced with these natural calamities now, how do we adapt? I'm Rob Smith from the Jaudano First Nation in British Columbia. I travel to Nunavut to see firsthand the drastic impacts of climate change happening now in real time. Threatening an ancient way of life. This is my very first visit to the Eastern Arctic. When I landed, I met Q, Komoriak and a local hunter. He took me on a day hike just outside Callaway. You don't have to go far to feel you're in the middle of nowhere. We were on his land and it was spectacular. There was no game. Instead, we picked some berries and did a little target practice. The most beautiful day. So it's pretty hard to tell a story about the end of the world when this is what you see. Where's the problem? That's why you have to listen to the people who know the land. It was supposed to be frozen. It was December or January, the coldest time of the year, and it didn't freeze at one spot. It was all slush. It didn't want to freeze. We almost sunk with the skidding. How'd you get out? It's driving faster. Hmm. Huh. So you hit that slush and then you just gunned it? Yeah. That was unexpected deep water. Q might have suffered serious injury or even death because of the lifestyles of Southerners, or Kualnuyuk, the Inuit called white people. All the f***ing pollution all around the world is we're getting affected by it. Nunavut has been an international focal point for climate change. For years, we've been told the predictions of melting Arctic ice, how it will put stress on animals. The polar bear is an iconic symbol for climate activists, often to the chagrin of the Inuit. We've managed the bear so well in Nunavut that people are saying there's too many bears out there. We are the first generation to really feel the effects of climate change and the last that can prevent it is worse the consequences. Remember the 2015 Paris Agreement, the latest global effort to save us all? We need to halt global warming at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial revolution levels. If the earth warms by two degrees, the United Nations Panel on Climate Change points to extreme heat waves, floods, droughts, rising sea levels, melting sea ice in the Arctic, the UN calls it a global emergency, and we only have a decade left to fix it. Pretty much, yeah, I've been hunting for over two years. Maybe we can pull the wool over the eyes in Southern Canada for now, but in Nunavut, the signs of climate change are already visible. 10 years ago, we would see snow, and we would see ice on this lake. There would be ice about this thick. There's no water, there's no ice, no snow. I've been catching minnows and frogs and crayfish in my little pond. And even in my lifetime, I've seen a complete changeover from that biodiversity. 
The species have changed, the landscape's beginning to change. Man, I don't see a lot of indigenous scientists, right? That's just not a thing you see in universities. Dr. Bobby Wash holds an interesting position. In his faculty, he has the opportunity to bring two worlds together. Just to really elevate that capacity of indigenous peoples uh, in science, uh, being able to utilize their own unique perspectives and bring them into this unique field uh, that is really needed to actually you know, confront a lot of those uh, world problems that we're facing right now. Science has been slow to adopt traditional knowledge. It's not just taking those stories, but it's making sure these stories are actually making big changes in policy and legislation in actual science and actual uh, ways that we think about the world. There is a very significant network of what I would call actors uh, who are very powerful and very wealthy, who are motivated to deny climate change. Sociologist David Tyndale offers advanced studies on climate change at the University of British Columbia. If uh, people are working in a sector that in some ways is contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, like they're working in the oil and gas sector, for example, um, you know, they, they tend to be more likely to discount some of the evidence. Kevin Taft, former liberal leader in Alberta, is the author of the book Oil's Deep State. He paints the picture of our governments doing the bidding of the oil industry and a world coming to terms with climate change. They know that when they go to Germany or go to Britain or go to France or go to Japan, they're seen as people whose product is dangerous to the planet. They're fighting for their lives. Literally, they're fighting for the life of this industry. Taft begins his book recounting the run-in with an oil man during his time in politics, who said, if you don't get with our program, there will be no olds barred in the future. You won't even know what hit you. Taft then wrote, Darth Vader had raised his anger and let me know that looming behind him was the Emperor. One of the so who's, who's Darth Vader? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he kept Vader's confidence. Instead, we talked to him about this man, Bruce Carson. He had a criminal list of charges as long as your arm. So how does a guy like that end up being a close advisor to the Prime Minister of Canada? Carson was Stephen Harper's advisor. He left Ottawa in 2009. The University of Calgary went looking for funding. They got the dollars and with it came Bruce Carson. He's not an academic, he's not a scientist, but he ends up the head of a of, a, of a, what was supposed to be a scientific institution studying energy and environment. Carson maintained his position with the Prime Minister's office while at the university. And then Carson comes in, uh, turns out on the payroll of the oil industry, and, and redirects the whole purpose of the institute toward uh, advancing policies friendly to the oil industry. And pretty quickly, some of the key scientists involved just um, throw up their hands in disgust um, and, and leave. Carson exploited his Ottawa connections, bringing together high-level bureaucrats trying to influence Canada's energy policy in favour of the oil industry. Taft says the men who originally funded Carson are smart, motivated and playing the long game. The really disturbing thing about all of this is that through these manipulations and machinations and, and frankly some illegal behavior as the courts concluded the oil industry is able to get um, government policy written using the oil industry's own words so you can actually follow an oil industry position paper on this or that and you'll see the same phrasing literally in government regulations. Taft calls this industry capture there is so much industry money and with that comes pressure over a four-year span starting in 2008, oil lobbyists met with government officials nearly 4,000 times, triple any other lobby group in that same period. Carson was found guilty of influence peddling in 2016 and charges under the Lobbying Act in 2019. What happens in Ottawa and Alberta matters in the Eastern Arctic. 
Josh Olerud has a young family to support. Hunting offers a major food source. When we come back... We need water for our animals and we need water for ourselves too. Josh Ullerut has already given quite a list of changes he's witnessed in Nunavut in the eastern Arctic, something I've never considered. Melting ice is still a source of fresh water. We need water for our animals and we need water for ourselves too. On the flip side, there's more seawater. Years ago before at the shore, it used to be far. Maybe it's from the climate change, the ice is melting away and water getting bigger. From the waves, our land is uh, vanishing. Hunters here are stressed. This year, I have noticed that there is no ice at all. Winter time is getting shorter. Winter, if I go to hunting by snowmobile, not enough snow anymore on the ground. It's getting harder to track animals here, both land and sea, and the cost of living off the land is going up. We pay about one barrel, one barrel, two hundred fifty dollars in haulage. It's, 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 it's a lot expensive money. We were here in the fall in the Arctic. That should mean snow. It's not snowing at all. It's very sunny. It's like summer. It's not, it doesn't feel like fall. And then you can you can even feel the heat. Most people think of science as lab coats and laboratories or computers and lots of math, and they'd be right. This is science, meticulous, repetitive, documenting the data. But this is science too, putting on the galoshes and digging in the dirt. Research here in Iqaluit begins at low tide. It's a current snapshot of, of what's going on with the ecosystem here in Iqaluit. It's called the Canada Coastal Environmental Baseline Program. There are six research sites across Canada. It might not look obvious, but Jennifer Amagwalik and Chris Lewis are at the front lines in this war on climate change. I think I'm doing the best I can, you know, through my everyday work and job and working with the community is to try and have some solace in knowing that we're collecting some information right now that can be used in the future, right? If we see further environmental changes. To go into battle, you need data. The task is massive, but to start, they head to the bottom, looking for the tiniest of creatures, anthropods, at the bottom of the food chain. Oh, we can figure out how human impacts might affect the, the ecosystem in the future. But is it too little too late? To get answers to that question, we walk to the top of a little hill just outside Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Is that enough to capture the change? Do we understand the natural rhythms of these ecosystems when we study them for three to five years? We, we know something about them. There's only so many dollars to go around and it's, it's just a reality of our lives. Over 40 years of research, Professor Alec Aiken has seen the Arctic transform before his eyes. And what you're seeing there especially is the critical loss of sea ice as a habitat for marine organisms across that circumpolar north. And with that comes all sorts of changes. We change the food chains in the north, we expose coastlines to erosion, there's increased risks to coastal flooding. As it stands right now, if nations keep their promises made in Paris, we halt warming at three degrees. 
To halt it at 1.5 degrees Celsius requires an emergency response. But Greg Flato says there are pathways forward. And they do involve very transformative changes in the way that energy is produced, the way that energy is consumed, the demand for energy, uh, the infrastructure that we, we use for, for travel and, and industry and so on. So those, those challenges are, are, are surely significant. So what will these changes look like in the future? Maybe we had a glimpse of that with the government reaction to COVID-19, people working from home, restrictions on travel, but can we commit to these types of major changes for the long haul? You may recycle and compost, and yet there's still that 30 minute commute to work, consuming fossil fuels to earn a living. Kevin Taft has shown that the oil industry, for one, is not going down without a fight. In the 70s, Exxon and other companies studied climate change. Their own scientists gave dire warnings. I think in one case, it was globally catastrophic effects. Like that's the internal correspondence in these oil industries. That's what the scientists are saying to the executives. And then the executives, they wrestle back and forth. And I sometimes imagine, what were these meetings like? Like there were probably some people there saying, I don't think we should do this. Why don't we change course? But in the end, they didn't change course. They doubled down. We have in the West, in particular, economic systems that have been perpetuated on, we always need to see growth. And that growth is, is often associated with, you know, the consumption of natural resources. I don't think, and so I guess I'm the doomsayer a little bit here, I just don't think a society as a whole that we are, you know, going to be able to put the brakes on this. If you want to see the future now, look no further than Tuk 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 in the Western Arctic. It's about to sink into the sea. To hear Aiken tell it, Canada has to prepare for climate refugees. We brought in sandbags that didn't work. We put down, you know, plastic skins. We used rubble from buildings that had been destroyed by waves. They lasted two, three, four years and the waves took them all away. Nothing that we've done no interim you know restoration project has is going to save the coastline at tuck the land used to be way out there we used to have fun on the beaches that's the most we play and we slide and no there's no more you really have to dig and you almost need a magnifying glass to read it but it's there the united nations 1.5 degree report makes this recommendation well, I think indigenous knowledge is essential, especially in the in the adaptation realm, realm where you know people in a particular community that that uh, have have lived in that community or in that area for for generations know all about the the environment and the local uh, uh, habitat and so on have a particular uh, expertise that can be used to to optimally adapt to a changing climate. It's so obvious, right? And I feel like it's, it's one of those duh moments where we are only now thinking about utilizing this type of knowledge as a, a way to support our needs to actually change the processes that are happening on the planet and the way we're treating the planet. The report says we must consume less. We can't focus on endless economic growth and we can't forget the poor. There are hints here of my own people's traditional laws and values. Indigenous people have always joked amongst ourselves that the world would be a better place if they thought and acted a little bit more like us. But the real threat here is that we could lose that traditional knowledge. What does that mean for our connection, uh, for our ability to actually interact and utilize and be responsible for the environment if we really can't understand what's going on because of climate change? It might really um, have some really dire effects on the ability to produce new indigenous traditional knowledge that is uh, relatable and that is understandable for future generations. So let's review. We will hit the 1.5 degree line sometime next decade. 
but 1.5 degrees is not some kind of starting line. Change is happening now, and some areas are feeling it worse than others. Some of the changes are permanent and won't be reversed. World leaders made commitments in Paris, including Canada, but the message from Ottawa is mixed. We're working with Indigenous peoples to co-develop and implement real accommodation measures to make our environment, our coast, and our communities safer, healthier, and better protected than ever before. But just moments later in that very same presser. Today, I am announcing that our government has newly approved the Trans Mountain Expansion Project going forward. We asked the Environment Minister for a sit-down. We were not granted one. Let me ask it this way. Are you satisfied with the world's reaction to your report at 1.5? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough, a tough one for me as a scientist. Um, I guess for me personally, I, I see encouraging signs. Uh, we talked before about the, the deployment of of renewable energy and the, the increasing pace at which uh, things like solar and wind power are being deployed around the world. Being a scientist, I think you have to be optimistic or, or your life is pointless. But, but I think this is an interesting question because I feel like I'm a pessimist when it comes to uh, my idea that we're going to be able to stop it. I really think we've just missed the opportunity uh, to really stop some of those major effects from happening but I think I'm very optimistic about our ability to adapt and begin to create a new society that is more equitable in terms of who gets a say in how the world works and also more optimistic in uh, making people start to realize how important the, you know, that physical, that biological environment is to us humans uh, to, to allow for the continuation of our species. Growing up, I used to see snow beginning of August, and I used to see glaciers, and now there's nothing. It's affecting our animals and what we do on this land. I don't know what we could do to help it. It's just that I think we have to go through it. With everything that's gone on with hydro and stuff like that, how it's affected my family, it's dispersed us. That lake now, for example, has a mercury level that's toxic. It doesn't compare to the surrounding lakes at all. Fixing it? No, you can't fix this. How are you going to fix it?